So now that the elections are over, we should take a moment to recognize a very serious problem with a Republican Congress trying to take away the rights of millions of workers in the United States. You see, most conservatives have a very real problem. And the problem isn't with their authoritarian views or the need to reward the riches among us. For you see, they don't care about the middle class. Their problem is explained by a look at just one person. Santa Claus. No, I'm not kidding. You can actually look at this as a review of the past 35 years and their politics with the gift-giving Saint Nick. Or rather, a review of their two Santa Claus theory as described by Jude Waninsky. Who was Jude Waninsky? Well first, let's go back to when conservatism was in full swing. In 1929, after four years of the Republican Depression, FDR came in with more liberal policies that saved capitalism. The banks were regulated, soldiers in World War I were given back pay, and Republican conservatism was banished by an overwhelming Democratic-controlled Congress that showed the benefits of a strong coalition of unions and liberals that prospered for over 60 years. The second wave of conservatism came after an unsuccessful presidential bid by Barry Goldwater in 1964. A 28-year-old Jude Waninsky felt that conservatism was doomed after Barry Goldwater lost out. This conservative view was the same as Herbert Hoover, who believed that market fundamentalism was a virtual religion, even though Barry rejected the social conservatism of his own party. Economists such as Ludwig von Mises and Milton Friedman preached that the government couldn't do anything right, even though Social Security was a successful program along with the many benefits of government spending coming from high taxes. In essence, the world of finances should be left to the big boys who ruled Wall Street and international finance such as the very ones that imploded the economy of 1929 for their own private profit. Hoover infamously followed the advice of his Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, the Tim Geithner of the day, who said in 1931, liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmers, liquidate real estate, purge the rottenness out of the system, high costs of living and high living will come down, enterprising people will pick up the wrecks of the less competent people. And so the Republican mantra of lower taxes, reduce the size of government, and balance the budget was born. So where does Santa fit in, that wonderful gift giver? Those were the Democrats. They were the bestowers of gifts such as Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, while Republicans were the stingy Scrooges looking to take away these gifts for the working class people that needed it. And that's why Dwight D. Eisenhower, the liberal-slash-conservative moderate who was successful re for Republicans, wrote in 1954 to his brother, should any political party attempt to abolish Social Security, unemployment insurance, and eliminate labor laws and farm programs, you would not hear of that party again in our political history. There is a tiny group, of course, that believes you can do these things. Among them are H.L. Hunt, a few other Texas oil millionaires, and an occasional politician or businessman from other areas. Their number is negligible, and they are stupid. Yet, this sound advice Goldwater rejected. Extremism in defense of liberty has, was no vice, and moderation was no virtue. He told his nominating convention, and he doomed his party. So what happened to Republicans after their banishment? Nixon won in 1968, but didn't dare try the economic conservatism of Goldwater. Jerry Ford kept out of that fight. So in 1974, a plan was hatched. For you see, Jude Waninsky had had enough of big government spending, such as that by unions on projects such as roads, bridges, and highways. Then raising taxes on businesses and rich people to pay for things didn't have much of an effect on the working people whose wages were steadily going up, making Democrats look like Robin Hoods by taking from the rich and funding programs for the poor and working class. If you railed against those programs, you lost elections. Then there were economies driven by demand. People with good jobs have money in their pockets and want to buy things. The job of the business community is to either determine or drive that demand to their particular goods, and when they're successful at meeting demand, more factories get built, more people are employed to make more products, and the newly employed people have a paycheck to further increase demand. So in Inski, decided to turn the classical world of economics, which has operated on this simple demand-driven equation for 7,000 years, on its head. 
In 1974, he invented a new phrase, supply-side economics, and suggested that the reason economies grow wasn't because people had money and wanted to buy things, but that things were for sale, tantalizing people to part with their money. The more things there were, the faster the economy would grow. Then Arthur Laffer took that equation even further. Laffer suggested as taxes went down, revenue to the government would magically go up. And so the Republicans came out of the wilderness with a new way to promote the same policies. Enter Ronald Reagan, who suggested that we cut taxes on the rich and the businesses. The tax cuts would cause the rich to take the surplus money and build more factories and import large quantities of cheap stuff from low labor countries. And the more stuff from China and the Foxcons of cheap labor, the faster the economy would grow. Yet some Republicans were horrified, such as George Bush, who called this voodoo economics. Bush had stated that the nation would be thrown into such deep debt that we'd ultimately crash into another Republican Great Depression. So how to sell supply-side economics? Well, in 1976, Wininsky rolled out to the hard-right insiders about his two Santa theory, which enabled Republicans to take power in America for the next 30 years. Democrats were Santa Claus by bearing gifts from the largesse of the federal government. Well, Republicans could be gift givers too. Government spending could increase under Republicans. Plus, Republicans could be double Santa Clauses by cutting people's taxes. It would only be a small amount for the working class, but it would be a far larger tax cut for the rich that would be heavily marketed, giving them hundreds of billions of dollars. The rich could import or build more stuff, increasing supply and stimulating the economy. The growth in the economy would mean that the people paying taxes would pay more because they were earning more. So Democrats were stuck. They could be the anti-Santa for raising taxes or for cutting spending. One or the other would lose them elections. Reagan rolled out supply-side economics in the early 80s and cut taxes while exploding military spending. The budget deficit exploded and the country fell into a deep recession. So how is this explained? Well, David Stockman had the answer with a great new theory. They were starving the beast of government by running up huge deficits that Democrats would never in the future talk about national health care or improving social security, which pleased conservatives such as Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan, feeling generous, opened the spigots of the Fed, dropping interest rates and buying government bonds, producing a nice healthy goose to the economy. Then he counseled Reagan to increase taxes on people making under 40000 a year by increasing the Social Security FICA payroll tax, then letting the government borrow those hundreds of billions of dollars off the books to make the deficit look better than it truly was. So what's Reagan's score on the deficit? Well, in 1980, the federal budget was under $1 trillion. In 1988, it was $3 trillion, and the dollar bought more stuff than supply-side economics had. In other words, Reagan and G.W. Bush ran up more debt in eight years than every president in history from George Washington to Jimmy Carter combined. So Democrats had to become the deficit hawks. Bill Clinton had run on an FDR-like platform of strengthening the New Deal, strengthening labor, and instituting national health care. He made the desperate choice of raising taxes and cutting the size of government on the advice of Greenspan. He had raised taxes, balanced the budget, producing a surplus, and cut numerous programs, declaring an end to welfare as we know it, along with an end to the era of big government in his second inaugural address. He was the anti-Santa, and the result was an explosion of Republican wins across the country who campaigned on supply-side tax cuts and pork-rich spending increases. So it goes that Republicans have found their way. They never talked about the elimination of programs. They just promoted tax cuts. And George W. Bush did the exact same plan. He rammed through even larger tax cuts, especially the cut of the income tax rate of the rich, which allowed people like him to be taxed at a minimal 15% rate. George W. Bush even outspent Reagan, which no one thought was possible. In rapid succession, three conservative presidents had cut income taxes on the rich from 70% to under 30 percent. The money didn't trickle down. Just as it did in 1929, the rich had been pouring their surplus money not into factories but into the stock market, inflating a bubble that would have to burst. While Jude Waninsky died in 2005, his philosophy created the same effects as 1929. 
They initiated a bubble economy that would let the very rich skim the cream off the top just before the ceiling crashed in on working people. The Republicans had won. They held power for 30 years, made themselves trillions on public funds, cut organized labor's representation from 25% when Reagan came into office to less than 7% now, and left a massive deficit that some misguided conservative Democrats are clamoring to shoot Santa with working class tax hikes and entitlement program cuts. So as we look at the grand bargain negotiations, let's remember who was naughty and nice for the past 40 years. The Republicans created the Great Republican Depression twice in 75 years. They made themselves out as the plutocrat party, only interested in tax cuts for the rich. They have a Northwest pledge, not what's best for the nation, but best for the richest in the world. Why don't we remember who destroyed the economy and give them their lump of coal in the next few years?